Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and thank you for letting me be a part of your scripture study or your lesson prep this week. My goal is to help you to study and teach the scriptures with more relevancy, impact, and power. And this week, we're going to be digging deep into 2 Nephi chapters 1 through 5. And some really quick information here. If you'd like a printable lesson plan based on this video or the PowerPoint slides or handouts that I use to make them, just go to teachingwithpower.com and you're going to find links to my channel, the blog, and the Etsy shop. Also, I'd like to keep up the challenge that I gave last week. I want you to leave a comment below of one thing that you learned from your scripture study that I didn't cover this week. I would really love to learn from you as well as you learning from me. And with that said, let's go ahead and dig deep. To start us out, some quick background on these particular chapters. 2 Nephi chapters 1-4 through represent Lehi's dying words of counsel to his family. And chapter 1 is mainly directed at Laman and Lemuel. And Lehi is going to say something very interesting and kind of ironic in verse 21 to them. He's going to ask them to be something. What is it? And the answer is he says he wants them to be men. And why is that ironic? Well, because they are men. At this point, they're married. They have children of their own. They are well into adulthood at this point. So what does that suggest about Lehi's definition of manhood? Manhood is not about age. It's about character. There's something about the way that Laman and Lemuel are acting that's not becoming of men. Lehi is going to help us understand what it means to be a real man. Now, the definition of manhood in the eyes of the world is very different from the definition of God. I'd like to do a brief brainstorming session with you here. What are some of the measures of manhood in the eyes of the world? I invite you to pause the video for a minute and make a quick list of your ideas. I've done this activity many times with my classes, and, and here's a sampling of some of the kinds of answers that I've gotten over the years. How much money I have in my bank account? How many people I have control over at my job? How much rubber I can lay on the road when I peel out my sports car? If I can slam dunk a basketball on top of you? How high my truck is lifted? How many women I can conquer or dominate? How smart and successful I am? How tough I am in a fight? How much alcohol I can handle? How many tattoos and piercings I can cover my body with? How big my house is? How many curse words I can drop in a single sentence? How loud my bass can blast while I drive down the road? How bulging my biceps and chiseled my abs are? Or how effectively I can intimidate, bully, or demean those that are less powerful than myself? These are just some of the answers that I've gathered. And these are the world's measures of a man. Now, don't get me wrong here. Not everything on that list is something bad. There's nothing wrong with being strong, smart, athletic, successful, having money, or a lifted truck. But if that's how you measure your manhood, if that's your priority and your focus in life, and where you get your sense of value, then I think you're misguided. And some of the things on that list are contrary to God's laws. And most of the things on that list are all about the outward appearance, about appearing a certain way to others. And when you think about it, that is rather childish. I have little children, and one of the things they love to say is, Watch me, Daddy. Look at me, Daddy. Look at what I did. Look what I can do. And we praise them and say, Good boy or good girl. That's wonderful. Some of us never grow out of the watch me, Daddy, look at me stage. Look at my car. Look at my success. Look at my muscles. Look at my money. Look at me. Look at me. Many get their sense of validation from other people, from praise, from recognition. Their center of self-worth lies outside of themselves rather than internally. The things on this list do not make you a real man. If I feel like I have to have these qualities, then I'm not really a man. I'm a little boy that needs these crutches to feel like I'm a man. Manhood is something else. It's character and a certain kind of character. A value that comes from within. I love this quote from Bishop Richard C. Edgeley. 
Adulthood comes to us one way or another if we live long enough. True manhood, however, comes only if and when we earn it. You can describe a man in inches, pounds, complexion, or physique, but you measure a man by character, compassion, integrity, tenderness, and principle. Simply stated, the measures of a man are embedded in his heart and soul, not in his physical attributes. Satan has his man, and God has his man. And Satan has his characteristics of manhood, and God has his. Satan would present his characteristics as the true measurement of manhood, and God's criteria as weak and wimpy. But one must understand that Satan's criteria will almost always be the easiest and the wimpiest. Satan's way takes no courage, no character, no personal strength, and it proves no manhood at all. Well, Lehi is going to teach us what it means to be a real man. And women, this doesn't have to exclude you. I'm framing it in terms of manhood because Lehi is speaking to men here. But these qualities are applicable to you as well, so don't tune out. But parents and teachers of boys, I found this to be a very powerful lesson for young men. Don't pass up this opportunity to teach them what it means to be a man in the eyes of God. So that's the challenge. Look closely in verses 21 through 27 for qualities of real manhood. And some of those qualities are going to be stated in the negative, as in Laman and Lemuel, you should be doing these things to be a real man. I found at least eight things. Let's see how many that you can find. And here are some that I see. In verse 21, arise from the dust. Real men arise from the dust. They're clean, spiritually and morally clean. They shake off the dust of the world. They don't need the outward, worldly measures of manhood to see their worth. Their worth is derived from within, from their commitment to eternal principles. Real men are determined. They have drive, they have vision. They have a plan, and they work hard to fulfill it. And they are determined in something, in one mind and in one heart, united in all things. One mind and one heart is the definition of Zion. They're united with others in their efforts to build Zion. They're not contentious. They're peacemakers. They don't put other people down to make themselves feel better or look better. They build people up rather than tear them down. They know how to be team players and work for the good of others, rather than just themselves. They're awake. They're anxiously engaged in a good cause. They're not apathetic or lazy or just sit around playing video games or watching Netflix all the time. They're up and doing. Real men do dress a certain way, I suppose. They wear something, the armor of God. They're warriors of God. They stand up to evil and temptation. They have righteousness, truth, the gospel of peace, salvation, faith, the spirit, and the word of God with them at all times. They fight valiantly for Christ on the battlefield of life. They're not bound with the chains of sin. They're not shackled by bad habits and addictions, drugs, alcohol, pornography, gambling, smoking, they have full use of their agency, and they're free from these things. They come forth out of obscurity. They're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. They're willing to set their light on a candlestick for everybody to see. They don't sit around worried about the judgments or the criticisms of the world or other people. They do what's right because it's right. They're bold in their testimony and in their actions. Captain Moroni comes to mind. He wasn't worried about what others thought. He stood for something, and he was willing to waive his beliefs and what he stood for in front of everybody else without shame. Real men certainly don't blend in with the rest of the world. Real men don't rebel. At least, they don't rebel against those whose views are glorious and that keep the commandments. The world's image of manhood often includes rebellion against authority, rebelling against parents, teachers, church leaders, law enforcement, or society in general. Real men don't feel the need to rebel against authority figures just for the sake of rebellion. They can be great leaders, but they can also be great followers and team members. 
they're humble enough to recognize the experience, goodwill, wisdom, and counsel of other people. They don't rebel, especially against the prophets. Real men are instruments in the hands of God. As husbands, fathers, citizens, missionaries, employees, teachers, and leaders, they move the work of God forward and follow his instruction and his counsel. They don't seek power and authority over others, but the glory of God and the welfare of others. The world's measure of manhood often includes power, success, telling other people what to do, dominating other people through intimidation, muscle, or intellectual prowess. They seek authority for authority's sake, but a real man uses his authority and his power to bless other people, to help them to be their best selves, to build up God's kingdom and not their own. And sometimes that requires them to speak with sharpness and to be bold. That's part of being a man as well. It's not all about submission and holding back, people-pleasing, and letting other people walk all over you. A real man is not afraid to call a sin a sin. They speak truth, even when it might not be easy for other people to hear. And lastly, they have the power of God and the Spirit. Another term for the power of God is priesthood. That's where they derive their power and their authority. The priesthood and the Spirit. Not charisma, not worldly success, not threats, and not money. A really great cross-reference to this chapter to continue this discussion would be the last half of section 121 in the Doctrine and Covenants, where we learn what true leadership in the priesthood is supposed to look like. Now as you stop and look at this list, compare it to the one that we made at the beginning. Are you a real man? Is there anything that you feel inspired to work on from that list? I have three sons, and I want them to know the definition of manhood and masculinity. I want them to be men, real men. And I know that there's a dangerous message communicated to the young men of today, that spirituality, compassion, and vulnerability is somehow weak or effeminate. I assure you that there is nothing more manly, more masculine, than standing up for your convictions, than not caring about the judgments and the pressures of the world, than centering yourself in eternal principles and truth. And if that definition of manhood still confuses you, all you really have to do is look to the most real man that's ever lived, Jesus Christ. Now there was a man. Jesus was not concerned about outward things. He was kind, willing to stand up to evil, he was compassionate towards women and children. He resisted temptation. He wept freely. And he was determined to obey the will of his Father no matter what. So, to conclude this chapter, I'll echo the words of Lehi. Arise from the dust and be men. A quick note here. There are some important ideas about the promised land at the beginning of 2 Nephi 1, verses 1-12 through 12 in particular, that I'd love to share with you. But I'm going to pair those with a thematically similar message that's shared by Jacob in 2 Nephi chapter 10. So I'll be covering the first part of chapter 1 next week, if you don't mind. So just hang tight with me on that one. But let's move on to 2 Nephi 2. I love art. And one of my favorite works of art is this mural right here. It's called The School of Athens by the Renaissance artist Raphael. I've actually seen the original in the Vatican, and it is a beautiful work of art. The idea behind it is that Raphael wanted to paint a picture of all the greatest thinkers of all time. So in the picture, you've got Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Euclid, Pythagoras, Ptolemy, and being the humble man that he was, he added himself into the picture too. And another interesting little side note, Raphael was a contemporary of Michelangelo, and after seeing the Sistine Chapel, decided that he ought to add him in as well. But there's one individual that I feel he left out. He forgot somebody that I feel would fit beautifully into this depiction of thinkers and philosophers. And that man is Lehi. I think that Lehi should be added to the School of Athens. And most particularly because of one chapter in the Book of Mormon, 2 Nephi chapter 2. 
perhaps one of the most philosophical chapters anywhere in the scriptures. And yes, it can be a little tough to understand and to teach, but I've got a way of presenting it that I feel will make it much easier to grasp. And we do jump around a little bit in the chapter, but I think this approach helps to give us the overall vision of Lehi's philosophy, or rather, God's truth. So I want to begin by inviting some guests into our discussion here. Each one of them has their own unique philosophy and worldview. These philosophies have been around for thousands of years and are still alive and well today. So this is certainly relevant. And we're going to let Lehi have an imaginary discussion with each of them using 2 Nephi chapter 2. So first, do you know what each of these people believe? And don't worry if you don't recognize these philosophies by name, because you're almost certainly going to recognize them by what they believe. The atheist says there's no God. Our existence is one big cosmic accident. Then you have the existentialist who says our lives have no meaning. We just exist. There's no purpose to life other than just existing. Then we have the hedonist. The hedonist says that there is a purpose to life, and that purpose is the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. His philosophy is probably best summed up with this popular phrase, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Then we have the pessimist who says, life is pain, suffering, and has no purpose. Life is miserable, and then you die. Next, we have the relativist, who says there's no real right or wrong in the world. It's all relative. There's no divine law or conscience, just societal ethics that have been developed over the centuries. You can't really break commandments because they're just man-made statutes that were created to govern societies. And then lastly, you've got the determinist. And this is a big one nowadays, and one of the most dangerous. They say that there's really no such thing as agency. We're all a product of our environment, upbringing, or our genetics. It's the Freudian approach. We can't really choose because our actions and beliefs have been determined by these influencing factors. Therefore, we aren't really accountable for our actions either. And I've seen this justification used in courts of law to justify crime. It's been used by government to shirk responsibility. It's been used by social groups to justify sin because, hey, I am determined to act in such and such a way. I really don't have any choice. I can't change. So there they all are. You can picture them in a room together, arguing and promoting their claims. When into the room walks Lehi. And Lehi has a response for each of these individuals. So let's go through this discussion together. I'm going to point out some verses to you, and with each, ask yourself how Lehi's teachings confront and answer their claims. So number one, the first person to shout out is the atheist. He says that there is no God, only matter. The fact that we're here is a fortunate or unfortunate, depending on how you look at life, accident. We live and we die, and that's it. What does Lehi have to say to the atheist? Starting about halfway through verse 13, and then adding in verse 14. And if there is no God, we are not, neither the earth. For there could have been no creation of things, neither to act nor to be acted upon. Wherefore, all things must have vanished away. And now, my sons, I speak unto you these things for your profit and learning. For there is a God, and he hath created all things, both the heavens and the earth, and all things that in them are, both things to act and things to be acted upon. And how does that answer the atheist's claims? What's Lehi's argument? If there is no God, then we are not. How can you explain the existence of creation without a creator? But we do exist. Therefore, reason dictates that there is something behind it all. Now, some might argue you can't explain the existence of God. Where did he come from? How can there not be a beginning somewhere? And you know what? We don't have an answer to that question. 
but neither do they. They might say the Big Bang. And we say, well, where did all the materials for the Big Bang come from then? We're on equal grounds. Our explanation and belief that there is a divine intelligence behind it all is on the same level. And my reason tells me as I look out over the earth and up into the night sky and fathom the miracle of the human body and life, my reason tells me that you can't have all that order and symmetry and logic and complexity without something intelligent behind it all. I feel it requires a lot of faith to believe that all of this is one big accident. If there was no God, all would have vanished away. And I share Lehi's testimony that there is a God, and he hath created all things. So our atheist sits down. But our existentialist stands up now and says, whether there's a God or not, it doesn't matter. One way or another, we exist. But there's no purpose in life. There's no meaning. We live and we die, and that's it. Lehi turns to him now and says, not so. And then reads, Verse 25, Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. How does that answer the existentialist's claims? What's Lehi's argument? We do have a purpose. There is a reason to our existence, and that purpose is joy. We exist that we might have joy. The existentialist sits down. At that, though, the hedonist jumps up and says, yes, yes, you're right. That is our purpose, to be happy, to feel pleasure and enjoy life. Lehi turns to him and says, not so fast. Your definition of joy is not the same as mine. And then he shares the beginning of verse 13. If ye shall say there is no sin, ye shall also say there is no righteousness. And if there be no righteousness, there be no happiness. And if there be no righteousness nor happiness, there be no punishment nor misery. So how does that answer our hedonists' claims? We do believe that the purpose of life is joy, but we know where real joy comes from. It comes from righteousness. Righteousness or obedience to divine law brings joy. Not just the pleasing of the natural man or the mere avoidance of pain. So can you see Lehi's argument beginning to shape up here? We exist, therefore, there must be a God. And that God has given us a purpose, happiness. And happiness is righteousness. Well, now the pessimist pipes up and says, yes, yes, pleasure and happiness, they're all great, but we don't experience much of it in this life. Life is full of pain, misery, war, violence, trial and tragedy. How can you say the purpose of life is joy when there's so much of the opposite in it? Lehi turns to him and says, verses 11 and 12, For it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things. If not so, my firstborn in the wilderness, righteousness could not be brought to pass, neither wickedness, neither holiness nor misery, neither good nor bad. Wherefore, all things must need be a compound in one. Wherefore, if it should be one body, it must needs remain as dead, having no life, neither death, nor corruption, nor incorruption, happiness, nor misery, neither sense, nor insensibility. Wherefore, it must needs have been created for a thing of naught. Wherefore, there would have been no purpose in the end of its creation. Wherefore, this thing must needs destroy the wisdom of God and his eternal purposes, and also the power and the mercy and the justice of God. How does that answer our pessimists' claims? Well, there's a reason for that pain, that opposition, that challenge in life. Righteousness and happiness could not be possible if there wasn't pain and suffering. This life is about experiencing that opposition. One day we're truly going to know joy because we've also known sadness. We'll understand the sweetness of heaven because we've experienced the bitterness of of mortality. We can experience that kind of thing now in life. Happiness is the feeling you have that day when the night before you were tempted to do something wrong and you didn't give in. How did you feel the next morning? Oh, I'm so happy that I didn't do that. 
But the joy and the happiness is only there because you had the possibility of doing otherwise. But let's say you did give in to that temptation. And how do you feel the next morning? Oh no, what have I done? You feel guilt, you feel regret. Why? Because it could have been different. If you didn't have that opposition, you wouldn't have the possibility of understanding either. Now the relativist gets up from his chair and says, okay, Lehi, I have a problem with your theory. You say righteousness is happiness, but how can people be righteous when there really is no such thing as right or wrong? What may be right in one culture is wrong in another. There's no divine law that says how we ought to act. Societies have just made up these arbitrary rules. To that, Lehi responds with verse 5. And men are instructed sufficiently that they know good from evil, and the law is given unto men. And verse 27. Wherefore, men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given them which are expedient unto man. And they're free to choose liberty and eternal life, through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. For he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself. How does that answer the relativist's claims? Men do know the difference between right and wrong. They're instructed sufficiently to know good from evil. There is a certain intrinsic morality amongst all peoples a collective conscience. Not that all cultures or people always follow those morals, but they seem to share a basic understanding of right and wrong. You could also add the beginning of verse 13 to this argument, which matches up with some of the other arguments. A lot of these do seem to overlap, but it says, if you shall say that there's no law, you shall say there is no sin, which is exactly what the relativist's argument is. If you shall say there is no sin, you shall also say that there is no righteousness. And if there be no righteousness, there be no happiness. And if there be no righteousness nor happiness, there be no punishment nor misery. And if these things are not, there is no God. And if there is no God, we are not. Neither the earth, for there could have been no creation of things, neither to act nor to be acted upon. Wherefore, all things must have vanished away. So Lehi's conclusion is that there is law. We as mortals have this sense of fairness and right and wrong. Even though we don't always follow it, we always feel the need to justify why we didn't follow it. You'll hear people say things like, that's not fair all the time. Well, what are they appealing to? They're appealing to a universal sense of justice that we all seem to understand and have agreed on. This is actually the point that's going to change C.S. Lewis from an atheist to a Christian. He came to the conclusion that there was an undeniable evidence of a universal law that all people seem to recognize, and therefore, there must be a God. And you can read all about that realization in his book, Mere Christianity. Now the determinist stands up and says, it's my turn now, Lehi. Even if there is a right and wrong out there, it doesn't really matter because we have no power to really make the choice which to follow. We are the way we are because of how and where we were brought up and our genetics. We were born the way we are. Nobody can really be held responsible for their choices because they can't help but be who they are determined to be. Lehi looks over at him and says, not so. And he continues with the end of verse 14 by telling us that there are two kinds of things that God has created both things to act and things to be acted upon. Then verse 16, Wherefore the Lord God gave unto man that he should act for himself. And then verse 27 again, And they are free to choose liberty and eternal life. And how does that answer the determinist's claims? There are two kinds of things that God has created, things that act and things that are acted upon. A rock can't act, it's acted upon. A stick can't act, it's acted upon. But a person was created to act. Man is different than all other creations on the earth. He acts. I can choose what I do with my time, with my life, with my actions, 
even with my reactions. We're not inanimate objects with no control. We're not even like animals that act on instinct. We are children of God endowed with the gift of agency to act and not just be acted upon. Yes, genetics and environment can play a strong role in our lives, but they don't determine it. And we're free to choose the direction that we wish to take in life, to choose freedom through righteousness or captivity through sin. So Lehi now squares up in front of all of them and outlines the philosophy of God's plan, countering each argument with truth. We exist, therefore there is a God. And we know that God has given us a purpose, happiness. And we know that happiness is only possible through opposition in all things. And we know what happiness is. It's righteousness. And we know what righteousness is. It's obedience to divine law. And we know that we are free to choose to follow that law or to disobey it. Now there they are. Each of them sits silently defeated by Lehi. But then we hear one more voice speak up, one we didn't even recognize was there. Who is it? The disciple of Christ. He slowly walks over and says, Lehi, I agree with everything you've said here. I believe it's true, but I don't always choose righteousness. At times, I disobey. I want to do what's right, but I often fail to do so. Is there any hope for me? And to the disciple, Lehi smiles and says, Yes, there is hope, and responds with verses 6 through 9. Wherefore, redemption cometh in and through the Holy Messiah, for he is full of grace and truth. Behold, he offereth himself a sacrifice for sin, to answer the ends of the law unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And unto none else can the ends of the law be answered. Wherefore, how great the importance to make these things known unto the inhabitants of the earth, that they may know that there is no flesh that can dwell in the presence of God, save it be through the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah, who layeth down his life according to the flesh, and taketh it again by the power of the Spirit, that he may bring to pass the resurrection of the dead, being the first that should rise. Wherefore, he is the first fruits unto God, inasmuch as he shall make intercession for all the children of men, and they that believe in him shall be saved. And how do those verses respond to the disciple of Christ's concerns? Yes, we will sin, and God knew that we would, but redemption is available, so he sent his Son as a sacrifice for sin. Jesus then could answer the ends of the law for us. I think that's an interesting phrase. What does it mean to answer the ends of the law? Well, if you draw a line and say that it represents the law, what's going to be at its ends? Obedience runs in one direction and disobedience the other. At the end of the obedience side, you'll find joy and reward and the Spirit. At the other end of the law, you have misery and punishment and the loss of the Spirit. Jesus knew perfectly, better than anybody else, the happiness of obedience because he lived a perfectly obedient life. He lived his entire life on that end of the law. Yet, what happened in Gethsemane and on the cross? He descended below all things. He traveled completely to the other end of the law and understood more deeply than any other human being the agony and the depths of hell and guilt and punishment, and physical pain and withdrawal of the Spirit. He answered that end of the law and therefore offers to us the opportunity to let His answer stand for us. So we don't have to travel all the way there ourselves. And because He's traveled the entire road, He's able to take us by the hand and show us the way to the other end of the law. How can He do that? Because He's been there before. He knows it deeply. We can now dwell in the presence of God through the merits and the mercy and the grace of the Holy Messiah. But what's our part? We've got to have a broken heart and a contrite spirit and believe in him. That's Lehi's answer to the disciple of Christ. 
You must have a humble heart and spirit. You have to have a desire to walk that path. You've got to have a willingness to accept God's law and strive to follow it. If we do, Christ will answer our end for us and bring us completely to the other end. It's an amazing chapter, isn't it? And there's more in there. We didn't even talk about what it has to say about the fall. But I guess my final question to ask you is, now that you know this philosophy, what's your plan? What are you going to do about it? My suggestion is that you follow Lehi's parting advice in verse 28. And now I would that ye should look to the great mediator and hearken unto his great commandments and be faithful unto his words and choose eternal life according to the will of his Holy Spirit. That you will choose eternal life through the power of the great mediator is my hope for you. 2 Nephi 3. I'll summarize this one. I call this chapter the four Josephs. See if you can find them all. You have Joseph, Lehi's son, who he's speaking to. Joseph of Egypt, who he says had a vision of the latter days and a seer that God would raise up whose name would be after his. Another Joseph. That would be Joseph Smith Jr., of course. And in verse 15, he says that his name would be after the name of his father. So our final Joseph is Joseph Smith Sr. And can you imagine being Joseph Smith translating this? He's translating this ancient record that he pulled out of the ground and all of a sudden he's reading about himself. It's talking about him in this ancient book. How amazing would that be? It's like that old movie, uh, The Never Ending Story, where the boy finds out that he's in the book and that he's a part of the story. And here's a marking activity for you. Mark everything you learn about Joseph Smith Jr. in this chapter. Also, take a particularly close look at verse 12 and Lehi's description of how the Book of Mormon and the Bible will grow together in the last days. Can you pick out the five things that these two books will accomplish when they're united as one? And as Latter-day Saints, we need to remember that. These books are meant to be used together. We should be just as familiar and comfortable and well-versed in the Bible as we are in the Book of Mormon, not just one or the other. The power of each is magnified when united, when they grow together. 2 Nephi 4 is a beautiful chapter. There are some places in the scriptures where you really get to see into the soul of the author. Now, you get to see a lot of Nephi's courage and his obedience and his faith from the outside. But in this chapter, he opens the windows of his soul and lets you peer inside. And in doing this, in his vulnerability, we get to see his inner struggles, which to me makes him a little more relatable in my mind. Maybe we can even see some of ourselves in Nephi. And with the youth, I've used this activity before to, to help them get a sense of how Nephi's feeling. It's a fill-in-the-blank, coded phrase kind of activity. But if you're teaching adults, I might just have them read the following verses and then ask them to describe in their own words how they think Nephi's feeling. But let me go over the answers from the handout with you here. Oh, wretched man that I am, my heart sorroweth. My soul grieveth because of mine iniquities. I am encompassed about because of the temptations and the sins which do so easily beset me. My heart groaneth because of my sins. Why should my heart weep and my soul linger in the valley of sorrow? My strength slacken that the evil one have place in my heart to destroy my peace and afflict my soul. Awake my soul, no longer droop in sin. And by looking at that list, how would you describe how Nephi's feeling? Sad, guilty, discouraged, dismayed, mournful, maybe even depressed comes to mind. Have you ever felt like Nephi before? So discouraged that you find your soul lingering in the valley of sorrow? And there's nothing wrong with visiting the Valley of Sorrow from time to time, but we don't want to linger there. Remember chapter 2, men are that they might have joy. But sometimes it's difficult to get yourself out of it. 
Nephi wants to be the best that he can, but he feels that he's less than he could be at this point. He's not satisfied with just being good. He wants to be better. And it's discouraging to him when he finds himself unable to do that. And what's Nephi's sin? You find it in verses 27 and 29. He asks, why am I angry because of mine enemy? He feels guilty for even being angry, probably with Laman and Lemuel. And that anger is taking away his peace. It's hard to feel the spirit when you're angry. Even though we could all probably agree that Nephi is a bit justified in feeling angry at this point. I mean, they've tried to kill him on multiple occasions, but he doesn't want to feel that way. He wants to be able to control more than just his actions. He wants to be able to control his feelings. So this leads me to our coded phrase here. What's this chapter going to teach us? How to defeat discouragement. Nephi is going to show us the way out of the Valley of Sorrow. And by the end of the chapter, you get the sense that he's feeling a lot better. But how does he get there? Go ahead and read verses 19 through 35 and see what you can find. And allow me to share some of the things that I see here. In verse 19, I know in whom I have trusted. Then in verse 20, my God hath been my support. And then in verse 34, O Lord, I have trusted in thee, and I will trust in thee forever. So one way to overcome discouragement is to trust in God. Place it in his hands. Know that in the end, God is going to be able to make all things right. He'll support you if you stay on his path. Then I like to lump these next verses together. My God hath been my support. He hath led me through mine afflictions in the wilderness. He hath preserved me upon the waters of the great deep. He hath filled me with his love, even unto the consuming of my flesh. He hath confounded mine enemies, unto the causing of them to quake before me. Behold, he hath heard my cry by day, and he hath given me knowledge by visions in the night time. And by day have I waxed bold and mighty prayer before him. Yea, my voice have I sent up on high. And angels came down and ministered unto me. And upon the wings of his spirit hath my body been carried away upon exceedingly high mountains. And mine eyes have beheld great things, yea, even too great for man. Therefore I was bidden that I should not write them. What's Nephi doing here? He's counting his blessings. He's expressing gratitude for all that God has done for him. This can help us too. Recognize all that you do have and all that God has done for you. By focusing on the positive, we can often lift ourselves out of the negative. Then notice what he's doing all throughout this chapter. He says, O oh Lord, over and over again. What's he doing? Praying for help. If you're discouraged, turn to God in prayer. He can help. Ask and ye shall receive. That's what he says in verse 35. Yea, I know that God will give liberally to him that asketh. Yea, my God will give me if I ask not amiss. Therefore, I will lift up my voice unto thee. Yea, I will cry unto thee, my God the rock of my righteousness. Behold, my voice shall forever ascend up unto thee, my rock and mine everlasting God. Amen. He's praying. In verse 32, May the gates of hell be shut continually before me, because that my heart is broken and my spirit is contrite. So we need to be humble and submissive to God's will and timing. And those are just a few of the things that I see here. If you can see some others, please share them with me in the comment section below. And I'd like you to ponder this. Have any of these things helped you through a time of discouragement? 2 Nephi 5, two brief thoughts from this chapter. What should we do when confronted with evil or temptation? I would answer that by saying, at times, the best thing to do is fight it. But it's not the only tactic. Sometimes the best thing to do is what Nephi does in chapter 5, verse 5. What is it? He flees it. I think that in some cases, that is the best way to approach these situations. Sometimes you just have to get away from it. Walk away from the date. End the abusive or destructive relationship. Quit the job. Leave home. Change schools. Find a new group of friends. Move. In terms of temptation, sometimes you need to turn off the computer, delete the bad music, throw away the inappropriate clothing, get rid of the alcohol and the drugs. 
Joseph of Egypt is another great example of this. What did he do when put into a tempting and compromising position with Potiphar's wife? The scriptures say that he fled and got him out. I suggest that we do the same. Now, you're going to have to be in tune with the Spirit because fleeing isn't always the right answer. Sometimes we need to fight and we need to work through things with people. But remember that fleeing is a viable and effective option at times. Because Nephi was willing to flee and abandon the evil, it made it possible for him to live after the manner of happiness, like it tells us in verse 27. Which leads me to my second thought. Read chapter 5 and mark everything you can find that helped the Nephites to live after the manner of happiness. I think you'll find some helpful ideas there if you wish to be happy too. And that is all I have for you this week. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, share it with somebody that you feel it could help. Thank you for watching. And as always, get out there and teach with power.